शांतिरंतरिक्ष गांतिर दिशा शांतिरवांतर दिशा शांतिरग्निशांतिर वायु शांतिरादित्य शांतिर चंद्रमा शांतिर नक्षत्राणि शांतिरापशांतिरोषदय शांतिर्वनस्पतय शांतिर गौशांतिरजाशांतिरश्वशांति पुरुषशांतिर ब्रह्मशांतिर ब्राह्मणशांति शांति रेव शांति शांति रुमे अस्तु शांति ही मे दे बी पीस ऑन अर्थ एंड इन द स्काई मे दे बी पीस इन द वाटर एंड इन ऑल डायरेक्शंस मे दे बी पीस इन द प्लांट्स इन द ट्रीज एंड इन एनिमल्स मे दे बी पीस इन द हार्ट्स ऑफ ऑल बीइंग्स मे दे बी पीस इन एवरीवन and in everything sarvetra sukhina santu sarve santu niramaya sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kaschit dukha bhag bhavet sarvastaratu durgani sarvo bhadrani pashyatu सर्वसद्बुद्धिमाप्नोतर्वसर्वत्रनंदतो मे ऑल बी हैप्पी एंड हेल्थी मे ऑल सी वॉट इज गुड एंड मे नो वन एक्सपीरियंस मेजरी मे ऑल ओवरकम देर ऑब्स्टिकल्स एंड अक्वायर गुड टेंडेंसीज मे पीपल एवरीवेर फाइन जॉय एंड फुलफिलमेंट Let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts. A good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point. That point can be our own breathing. Let us therefore practice breathing with awareness. As we breathe in, let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love, strength, and compassion. And as we breathe out, let us release all the stress, anxiety, and exhaustion in the body and mind. Let us practice this way for a while. Let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart. Although God is present everywhere and in everyone, the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our hearts. We can meditate in any way we have been taught. To remain focused, we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name. Let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of God in our hearts.
असतो सत्कमय तमसो ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय आवीरावीर्मेधी रुद्रयत्ते दक्षिण मुखम तेन मि नि मे द डिवाइन लीडस फ्रॉम दि अनरियल टू द रियल from darkness to light from death to immortality may the divine consciousness fill our hearts and protect us we begin today on verse number 21 as we have seen in this chapter we are studying the the manifestations of the divine speaking about the source of this universe the source from which we all come in abstract terms can be intellectually satisfying at some level but it's the idea still remains very hazy it's like this so oh, even those of us who see ourselves as devotees of god when we use the word god or when we use any of the different manifestations whichever aspect of divine we worship how real has the divine become in our mind has the divine become as real as the objects that we see in this world and we see that for most of us at least in the beginning the divine being is is real someone whom we believe in but someone who hasn't become as real to us as this world i don't need to believe that there is a table here because i see the table but i need to believe in god because i don't yet see god so belief or faith is necessary only until you actually experience it i don't need a faith that there is a table in front of me because i see it and but right now we need faith in god because we don't see god when we don't see the truth then the next best thing we can do is at least see something that will lead us to the truth it's a little bit like this um none of us can see light light can't be seen what we can see are the objects illumined by light and when there is objects illumined by light uh, we know that well i am able to see this object so there is some light from somewhere this light is coming because of which its object is illumined so looking at something which is tangible helps me go toward the source which is intangible and it's always like this for instance now that we are grown up 2 plus 2 equals 4 but seem like such an obvious thing but think about a little baby a little child you just tell a little child how much is 2 plus 2 uh it won't make sense because numbers are pretty abstract but at the same time if you say bring four apples and you put two apples on the table and say and if the child can count you can say how many apples there are and then you say well one two and then you take two more apples and put them alongside and said uh, adding two more apples on this table now how many there are then one two three four so when you add 2 to another 2 then it becomes 4 now the little child is able to see something tangible so you in the beginning you will need concrete objects to teach simple mathematical thing like addition subtraction later on if we need an apple every time we have to do mathematical calculation all through life then it will be then there's then there's a problem but at some stage we outgrow the need for apples 
or anything concrete, and we are able to deal with abstract numbers. That's exactly the point here, that God is the, nothing can be more finer than the reality of God. The world that we encounter is pretty gross, and we are gross. That's why we are able to encounter and deal with these tangible things. But in order for us to get in touch with that very refined reality, we need to become refined ourselves. So the more refined my own mind becomes, the more I have access to the refined, subtler aspects of reality. So that is what this chapter is about. So we have seen um, the request of Arjuna, that in how many ways, in how many forms, how, do you, how does God manifest? And we saw one verse, the verse number 20 last time, in which Krishna says, O oh, Kuda Kesha, I am the self residing in the minds of all creatures. I am the beginning, the middle, and also the end of beings. Now, in verses beginning 21, which we begin today, until the end of the chapter, almost the end of the chapter, Krishna will give various examples of where the divine manifestation can be found. Now, many of these examples come from um, Indian mythology. Some of these are from uh, text, as you will see. There is not much explanation needed here. If you are curious about the details, you can read through the commentary. There are some more, uh, and if you are more interested in mythological details, you can read, so we won't go into that. Except that to recognize just general principles. Krishna is here giving examples of things which are great in one way or the other, superior or one way or the other. Although God is present in everything, it is easier, at least in the beginning, to find the presence of God in things that excel in some way. That's the idea. So let's, let's read. So most of it is just going to be chanting together and reading the translation. Wherever some comment may be needed, that's what I will do. So let's begin with verse 21. Adityana Maham Vishnu Jyotisham Raviram Shuman Marichir Maruta Masmi Nakshatrana Maham Shashi Of the Adityas, I am Vishnu. Of luminaries, I am the radiant sun. Of the Maruts, I am Marichi. And among the constellations, I am the moon. Now again, in, in Indian mythology, they speak about 12, 12 Adityas. And among those Adityas, one is Vishnu. And so among the luminaries, among the, the effulgent objects, he says, I am the radiant sun. Now, Krishna is giving, saying, I'm the radiant sun because he's addressing us, the residents of this planet called the Earth. And for us, the brightest object known to us is the sun. But Krishna is not, the divine being did not create only this planet Earth or only the solar system. So if the Gita was being preached to somebody, some other galaxy, uh, Krishna may not have given the example of this sun, because um, if you look at the universe as a whole, um, we are first of all not that important in that universe. And our sun is a pretty mediocre sun. It's not even the, the brightest star around. But for us, uh, that's the brightest star. And Krishna is addressing us, so he's giving the example of this sun. Uh, that's to be kept in mind. Verse 22. Vedanam samavedosmi. Vedanam samavedosmi. Devanam asmi vasavaha. Indriyanam manaschasmi. Bhutanam asmi chetana. Of the Vedas, I am the Samaveda. Of the gods, I am Indra. Of the senses, I am the mind. 
and in beings I am consciousness. There are four, Vedas have been subdivided into four books and Krishna says of those four books he is Samaveda. Among the gods I am Indra in Indian mythology. Among all the celestial beings Indra is considered the king of the gods. Of the senses I am the mind. Now we have um, um, 11 senses according to one categorization. So five senses of knowledge, five senses of action, and mind is considered the 11th sense. Uh, Krishna here is saying giving the mind as a prime example because whatever data any of these other senses bring, that all of that is routed through the mind. So mind is kind of the coordinator and in some ways therefore more important than, than the other senses. And therefore Krishna says, among the senses, I am the mind. And in beings, I am consciousness. That of course is the Sat Chit Ananda. Chit is consciousness. So the divine being is, is the conscious substratum over which the entire creation stands. Verse 23. Rutranam Shankaras Chasmi Vittesho Yaksha Rakshasam Vasunam Pavakas Chasmi Merush Shikharinam Aham Of the Rudras, I am Shankara. Of the Yakshas and Rakshasas, I am Kubera. Of the Vasus, I am Fire. And among mountains, I am Meru. Meru is the mythological mountain um, considered to be the, the most significant and important mountain. Um, there is a story in Indian mythology of the churning of the milk ocean. And in that story, this mountain was used as a churning rod. Verse 24. Purodhasam chamukhyam maam Vidhipartha brihaspatim Senani nam aham skandaha Sarasa masmi sagaraha Know that I am Brihaspati, the foremost among priests, O Partha. Of army leaders, I am Skanda. Of natural reservoirs, I am the ocean. Of the priests, so Brihaspati is considered the priest, in, is a priest in heaven. He is a heavenly priest. Skanda is the army leader. He is the chief of the armed forces in heaven. Again, so superior to all uh, army leaders of the earth. Just a little observation. Why would they need army in heaven? If everyone is happy, if everyone is safe. So some of these are kind of hints to recognize that our notion that heaven is just bliss and peace, uh, probably not very accurate. Because if you need an army leader, obviously they need, <laughs> they need some protection. And there are plenty of stories uh, about how there is fights between, between the celestials and, and the Rakshasa. So there are good guys and bad guys in heaven um, as much as they are here. And so a discernment according to Vedantic thinking shows us that the heaven is perhaps not too different from the world we are already in. And therefore heaven as the highest goal Heaven as something, as the ultimate goal is rejected in Vedanta because it's not really too different from this world. 25. Maharshi nam bhruguraham giram asmyeka maksharam yadnyanam japa yadnyosmi Sthavaranam Himalayaha Of the great sages, I am Bhrigu. Of words, I am the monosyllable Om. Of sacrifices, I am the Japa sacrifice. Of immovables, I am the Himalayas. 
of the words. So the Om is considered the most sacred word in the Vedic tradition. Um, and of course, we, we know that even before our every service, we all chant Om together uh, thrice. It's a very helpful practice. Even if you're by yourself at some time and if you are alone, um, it's, it's a nice uh, just without disturbing your neighbors or anybody else at home, if you can just, just chant Om. Um, it does have, apart from the spiritual benefit, the immediate benefit, it does calm the whole system down. That's just uh, observation. Uh, there could be any number of explanations for it, but that's not the point here. The point is it works. And so apart from the spiritual benefit, there are many other benefits of just chanting Om. And that's why Krishna identifies with that. Of sacrifices, I'm the Japa sacrifice. Now there are many yajnas, many kinds of rituals, elaborate rituals in the Vedas, many kind of elaborate uh, pujas that came uh, during the, the, the Puranic period. It may not be possible for us uh, many of the Vedic rituals are now uh, out, out of work. Very few people even know how to do them. It may not be possible for us to do a lot of puja, but the one puja that we can all do is this uh, japa yajna, the one yajna. And those amongst us who practice japa every day, the japa itself can be seen as a yajna. Even if you do for a few minutes in the morning or a half an hour in the morning or half an hour in the evening, yet yetnya is, is an act of sacrifice. Um, so either that sacrifice can be of some material things. In, uh, why is, how is puja yetnya? Because you are offering, you're offering flowers, fruits, incense. Subjectively, the offering of yourself at the feet of God is also a yetnya. So. While we do japa, mentally, it's possible to visualize every repetition. Every time you repeat the mantra, you we can visualize as a flower. And then you are sacrificing, you're offering that flower at the feet of God. So if you have repeated your mantra 108 times, you've already offered 108 flowers. The beauty of this is even in the intensest winter, when flowers may not be available in your garden, you still can offer as many flowers as you want. We can see ourselves as a flower. Every one of us is a flower. And every repetition you do, you can offer yourself at the feet of God. So 108 time repetition would mean 108 times you have offered yourself. So it's a great way to practice self-surrender. And in many places, they have um, a collective japa yajna. So in many spiritual communities, what they do is on some fixed day, um, they decide either from, say, sunrise to sunset, or sometimes from throughout the night. So the community members then take turn to do japa. And we used to, when we were in, the, in Belurmat, in the monastic training center, so every Saturday night was a night for Japa Yajna. And so we had these one hour slots. And I think it probably, if I remember correctly, it began at eight o'clock, eight to nine, nine to 10, 10 to 11, 11 to 12. It went up right up to morning five. And, and everyone, it was mandatory, everyone had to sign up, but you could choose any of these one hour slots. And, um, it was not restricted to one hour. You could sit longer if you want, but you have to be there during the slot that you have chosen. The idea was throughout a given period of time, every member of the community is there repeating God's name. And it, it does just very tangibly changes. You can feel the, the, the atmosphere change. That's the beauty of the power of the mantra, the power of the divine name that when a group of people sit together and do it, you can actually feel a very tangible change. And that's what Japa Yadna. So whether or not there are a group of people doing it, even as a person, 
you can do it by yourself at home. You, even, you don't have to do it whole night or whole day. Whatever, even those few minutes in the morning, few minutes in the evening that you do. But if you do it regularly, that itself can become a yajna. And a yajna of that sort benefits not only yourself, but it benefits everyone around you. So if there is one member of the family who sincerely prays and meditates on God, the whole family gets the benefit of that practice. So sometimes if we are tempted to think, oh, spiritual life is just about oneself, um, why don't you go and help other people? Sometimes uh, I've heard this kind of criticism that uh, spiritual life is, is just for one's own sake. Not true, because um, when we practice meditation and prayer, sure, it helps the person who does it, but it also helps the, the immediate family and the benefit of meditation also comes in the quality of your life, the quality of your relationships, the quality of your work after your meditation is over. So in that, in that calmness, that fullness, that contentment, you go about doing your duties and responsibilities, it improves your work. It improves the atmosphere at home. It improves the atmosphere of the family. So a lot more benefit occurs even through one person practicing meditation. So it's not simply restricted to that person. Verse 26. sarva vrikshanam devarshinam chanaradaha Gandharvanam Chitra Ratha Siddhanam Kapilo Munihi Of all trees I am the Ashwatha, people tree. Of divine sages I am Narada. Of Gandharvas I am Chitra Ratha. And amongst perfect souls I am the saint Kapila. 27. Uchai Shravasama Shwanam Vidhimam Amrutod Bhavam Airavatam Gajendranam Naranam Chanaradhipam Of horses know me to be Uchai Shravas, born of the churning for nectar of lordly elephants, Airavata, and amongst men, the king. Both of these, the, the horse, Uchaishravas, and the elephant, Airavat, both were among the things that came up when that uh, milk ocean was churned. So be, all, that, all these great gods and both um, the demons, what they really wanted was this nectar the immortality, drinking which people would become immortal. So the, the real churning was occurring for that, but, but before that nectar came up, a lot of other stuff came up first. And among the other things came up was this Airavata and this Uchaishravas. So among the wonderful things that came up, Krishna is identifying with them. 28. Ayudhana maham vajram Dhenu namasmi kamadhuk Prajanaschasmi kandarpaha Sarpanamasmi vasukihi Of weapons, I am the thunderbolt. Of cows, I am the kamadhenu. I am the productive passion. And of poisonous serpents, I am vasuki. So a thunderbolt is supposed to be the weapon in the hands of Indra, the king of gods. And we, there are lots of stories about how with the help of this, he vanquished many of the dangerous demons. Kamadhenu, this cow was uh, one of the other great things that came up during the churning of the ocean. 29. <clears throat> Anantaschas mina ganam. Varuno yada samaham Pitruna Mariyama chasmi 
यम संयमतामहम Among non-poisonous snakes, I am Ananta. Of aquatic beings, I am Varuna. Of the manes, I am Aryaman. Of regulators, I am Yama. This Aryama was supposed to be the king of all the departed spirits. So again, the the great and the excellent in every category is identified with the manifestation of the divine. Thirty. Pralhadaschasmidaityanam. कालफ कलयतामहम् मृगाणां च मृगेन्द्रोहम् वैनते यश्च पक्षिणाम् Of demons I am Pralhada, of reckoners I am time, among beasts I am the lion, and among birds I am Garuda. I am of demons I am Pralhada, Pralada is actually one of the great um, saints, a child saint. And he said among the demons because he was born in a demon family. His father was a very um, great demon who didn't believe in God, who was an atheist. And in that family, this Pralada one. So he was a demon because he was born in a demon family. But he was actually one of the greatest saints in Indian mythology. 31. Pavanaf Pavatam Asmi Rama Shastra Bhritam Aham Jashanam Makarash Chasmi Srota Samasmi Janhavi I am the wind among those who move fast or wielders of weapon I am Rama among fish, I am the Makara. Of rivers, I am the Ganga. 32. Sarganam Adirantascha. Madhyam Chaivaha Marjuna. Adhyatma Vidya Vidyanam. Vadaf Pravadatamaham Of creations, I am the beginning, the end, as also the middle, O Arjuna. Of sciences, I am metaphysics, and I am the constructive reasoning of the controversialists. <coughs> the beginning, the end, and the middle, because God pervades everything, the God is source of everything. Of sciences, Vidya is in all, all knowledge, all kinds of knowledge. Uh, Adhyatma Vidya means the knowledge of the self, the spiritual knowledge. So among all branches of knowledge, spiritual knowledge is what is considered the highest. The highest because while other forms of knowledge can help remove my ignorance related to those, some aspect, it's only spiritual knowledge that goes to the root problem and removes the basic ignorance. And therefore, spiritual knowledge is considered the highest. Vadaf Prabhadatamaham. So, what the controversialist means, um, debates. <coughs> now, um, in the, these texts, they have, they describe three kinds of debate, three kinds of arguments. There are and you can see that, you can, you can identify with these things. Um, the best kind of debate in Sanskrit is called vada. So debate means, of course, when, when is there a debate? There is some topic about which there is no agreement. So there are at least two parties who have different views, oftentimes opposing views on the same topic, which is great. So what would be a constructive reasoning would be these two parties who disagree can come together. Each party puts forth their reasoning of why they feel their view is right and explain why they don't agree, what is wrong with the other person's view. Similarly, the other party does exactly the same. They point out the reason why they feel their view is right. They point out their objections to the op opposing view. 
the important thing is this. When this is happening, when one party is explaining their position, the other one listens carefully. When the, this party describes their position, this one listens. What both the parties involved want is the truth. They are not there to prove that I am right and you are wrong. They are there to know the truth. So when they go to the debate, obviously each of them believes that they are true, that they are on the right side. But they give a careful, open-minded audience to the other view, being always willing to be corrected. So if they find that, yes, the opposing side's argument is stronger, I had not considered a certain point, and therefore, so in a constructive reasoning, either of the party is willing to admit that, yes, I think you are right, I may be wrong. So their goal is not to win, their goal is to arrive at the truth. Now that is constructive reasoning. The second kind of debate is called jalpa. And jalpa means, so this is vada. Constructive reasoning is called vada in Sanskrit. Jalpa means both the sides, they put forth their views about what they believe is right, but they try in by hook or by crook, they will try to find mistake in the other person's view. They may not always do it in a, in a straightforward way. They may uh, indulge in subterfuge. They may kind of find um, right or wrong ways or some kind of a deceit. But the idea is I want to win. And I will somehow or the other, I will show that your proposition is wrong. That is called jalpa. The goal here is to win. And the third is called vitanda. There, the parties don't even, are not even interested in putting forth their proposition. Their only goal is to prove the other person is wrong. And so of these three kinds of arguments that can occur, Krishna says, I am the first one. Now this is important because oftentimes as we go about our day-to-day -day activities, whether in the family or a workplace, we do. Disagreement is fine. We will meet with people uh, about, uh, with, on certain issues. We may not agree. And when we sit for a discussion, what is our goal? If, if we are too convinced, I'm right, and then my only goal is to prove why the other person is wrong, then it's not constructive reasoning. And therefore, it's good, just as a form of humility, that while it's good to have views on everything, if you wish, but not cling on to them so tightly, not get identified with them so tightly that I feel that I have to then somehow or the other defend my view uh, against other views, even when a part of me really says what the other person is saying makes sense, but I don't want to give up because this is my view and I have to protect it. So that's the problem. So we have to see how many of the arguments we have in our life to which of these categories they belong. And as a spiritual seeker, arguments are fine. But if they are constructive, if our goal is to find truth, you can have great discussions. You can argue with your friends. But the goal should be to find the truth. Not that I will win the argument. I will prove that you are wrong. Then it, does, then it doesn't have a spiritual value. Verse 33. <coughs> Aksharanam akarosmi Dvandvasama sikasyacha Ahame vakshayaf kalo Dhataham vishvato mukaha Of letters, I am the letter A, comes in the beginning. And of compounds, I am the dvandva. Um, there are many uh, Sanskrit grammatical rules of how um, two words can be combined. And among those rules, he identifies with dvandva. 
I myself am eternal time. I am the universal dispenser. <coughs> 34. Mrityu sarvahara shchaham. Udbhavascha bhavishyatam. Kirti shrir vakchanarinam. Smritir medha dhritikshamam. I am the all-pervading death, the prosperity of potentially prosperous beings. Amongst women, I am fame, prosperity, speech, memory, intelligence, fortitude, and forgiveness. So there are these seven qualities. And in Sanskrit grammar, all of these seven qualities are in feminine gender. And so here, these seven qualities are personified as seven goddesses. The Qualities are virtues that are something that, that all of us can strive to attain in our life. All of these are it's fame, prosperity, speech, memory, intelligence, fortitude, and forgiveness. All are worthy goals in the life of a human being. Verse 35. Brihat sam tatha sam nam. Gayatri Chandasamaham Masanam Margashir Shoham Ritunam Kusuma Karaham Of the Vedic lyrics also I am the Brihat Sama, of meters I am the Gayatri, of months I am the Agrahayana, of seasons I am the spring. The Margashirsha or Agrahayana begins in the, in the middle of December, uh, according to a Gregorian calendar. Sometimes it is said that that is the first month when the Uttarayana begins. Now, whether to take it literally, identifying it with the month December, there is a lot of debate about it. Uh, the whole the year is divided sometimes into two parts the Uttarayana and Dakshinayana, the northern path and the southern path. And uh, again, as I said, whether it is identified with these months that we have um, is debatable. But it is believed that those who die during the Uttarayana period uh, go to a, to a higher plane than those who die in a Dakshinayana plane. One of the explanations given of why Bhishma, the great commander-in-chief in the, in the war, who after he was felled by Arjuna, by the arrows, uh, he had the, the boon to die at will. So he could choose the time of his death. And after he was felled by Arjuna, he remained that way for several months on this bed of roses. Roses. <laughs> Bed of arrows. Uh, and um, and then sometimes the question comes, what was he waiting for? Well, he could die. There's no fun lying on a bed of arrows for such a long time. And sometimes the explanation given was he was waiting for the Uttarayana to start. To, to, he himself was an enlightened being. He could have died any time. But to ho hold the the to strengthen people's faith in the scriptures, he, he waited for the Uttarayana to begin. So that's one of the explanations that is sometimes given of why Bhishma waited. Tamasmi Tejas Tejasvinamaham Jayosmi Vyavasayosmi Satvam Satvavata Maham. Of those who deceive, I am gambling. I am the prowess of the powerful. I am victory. I am effort. And I am the goodness of the good. So don't feel too guilty if you visit Las Vegas now and then. <laughs> Since the divine being is present even in gambling. But it's not an invitation to indulge into it. 
Vrishninam Vasudevosmi Pandavanam Dhananjaya Muninam Apyaham Vyasaha Kavina Mushana Kavihi Of the Vrishnis, I am Vasudeva. Krishna is the, the race in which Krishna himself was born. Of the Pandavas, I am Dhananjaya, that's Arjuna. Of sages, I am Vyasa. Of seers, I am the seer Ushanas. 38. Dando Dabayata Masmi. Niti Rasmi Jigi Shatam. Maunam Chaivas Miguihanam. Jnanam Jnanavata Maham Of Punishers, I am the rod. Of those desirous of victory, I am policy. Of secrets also, I am silence. I am the knowledge of the wise. So silence, practice of silence, is another great practice for spiritual seekers. So in some ways, silence Think about it this way. When we pray, when we meditate, we are practicing some kind of silence. You're not really having conversation with anyone else during meditation. But it's not a complete silence. Because oftentimes, when we are meditating, we are not so completely focused on the object of meditation because we are kind of continuing with some kind of uh, inner conversation. And sometimes not even connected with spiritual life. It will be inner conversation about something that is going on in our minds. And so then we are not practicing in that sense, maunam, silence, uh, even when you are praying or meditating. And that's, that's, that's one good way to start. Because sometimes people say, I'm going to practice silence, and they uh, stop talking with anyone for a limited time, which is okay. But we already have an opportunity to practice silence every day if we have our own personal practice of meditation and prayer morning and evening. So let us make an effort that during those few minutes when we pray, when we meditate, we are silent. So other than the thought of God, there should be nothing else in the mind. There should be no mental dialogue or conversation about anything else. Only then that prayer or meditation practice will be truly powerful. 39. Yachapi sarva bhutanam Bijam tadaham arjuna Natadasti vina yatsnyan Maya bhutam chara charam I am also Arjuna, that which is the germ of all beings, the seed. There is no being, moving or stationary, which can exist without me. So since the divine being is the substratum over which the whole universe is superimposed, uh, Without the divine being, none of us can exist. To go back to the <coughs> classical example of seeing, mistaking a rope for a snake, uh, a, a coiled rope in a semi-lit room, you mistake for a snake, the snake is dependent on the rope. If the rope were not there, the snake won't be there either. So just as the snake, perception of the snake is completely dependent on the existence of the rope, our perception of the whole universe, including our perception of ourselves, is dependent on God because all of these things have been superimposed on the divine being, on that pure consciousness. Verse 40. Nantosti mamadivyanam Vibhuti nam parantapa Eshatu deshataf prokto 
विभूतेर्विस्तरो मया O tormentor of foes there is no end to my divine glories these details of my glories have only stated in brief as i said in the beginning god manifests in everything in the universe and there you can never catalog them and enlist them because it's just beyond our scope and that's why krishna say this is only a very small brief limited sampling of my glories 41 यद्यत विभूति मत सत्वम् श्रीमदूर्जितमेवा तत्तदेवा वगच्छत्वम् मम तेजोम् शसंभवम् Whatever thing is glorious, excellent, or preeminent, verily. know that is born of a portion of my splendor so everything that is great good and glorious we can it's easier to feel and see the presence of god in that thing 42 athava bahunai tena kim jnate na tavarjuna vishtabhya hamidam kritsnam एकाम शेनस्थितो जगत बट ऑफ व्हाट अवेल इज इट टू यू टू नो ऑल दीज डिटेल्स आई एग्जिस्ट परवेडिंग दिस एंटायर यूनिवर्स बाय अ पोर्शन ऑफ माय सेल्फ इन द लास्ट वर्ड्स कृष्णा मेक्स दिस पॉइंट क्लियर देयर इज दैट इफ यू आर इंटरेस्टेड गो थ्रू ऑल दीज डिटेल्स बट इन द लार्जर पिक्चर इट डजंट मैटर इट्स इनफ फॉर यू टू नो that i pervade this entire universe but god that doesn't exhaust god fully it's only a tiny portion of god that pervade the entire universe in other words the divine being is so infinite so pervading that even this material universe about which we are talking is only a very small portion of that infinite being so that's the central message of this chapter that holding on to something which is tangible visible something that which we can see something that which we can grasp seeing the presence of god in these things it will become easier for us then to go towards the intangible so from gross to subtle that's why even the the journey that we have from prayer and meditation and worship is always we go with the hold of form we begin by holding on to some form some symbol and with the whole help of that form we go to a truth which is beyond all form which is formless and even beyond the notion of form and formlessness we take hold of a name a mantra or a prayer a sound but that takes us to that reality which is beyond all names beyond all sound so that's the idea taking hold of the concrete and going towards the abstract any thoughts comments questions ideas so when we see you know there's a churning of uh, the you know samudra manthan what we say and the whole objective was to just get the you know the the one thing but then apart from that there were many other things that came out uh, what was the significance of the other things well there's so the the it's a good question and there is not just one answer to it it's it's a, what did happen was this so they all wanted nectar when they started churning a lot of other stuff came up and people just it was a just a mad scramble who just grab you know things come and everybody wanted the best and they were just kind of fighting for it which can sometimes happen when you when you go to a mall to buy something with the idea of buying something how often we get distracted it's like other you know, because you know there are there's so many things available there and so 
usually we end up getting also the thing we want alongside many of the things that we did not want. But sometimes it can happen that people may even forget why they went there in the first place. They can get distracted by many other things. And that could have happened during the milk ocean time also. The, so the, the idea is there were lots of treasures in the, in, the, in the churning of the ocean. All these treasures came up. People must have gotten distracted. Some of them remembered why they were doing it in the first place, and so on. That, that's one way of looking at it, I guess. And that probably will, if you want to see the spiritual lesson that comes out of it, is then never let the goal of your life go out of focus. Because a lot of distractions will come. And um, if we allow ourselves to get distracted, then we may not reach the destination. That's the idea. Maharaj, when you were ex uh, giving an um, explanation that how that God also need, uh, they have an army. You know, mm -hmm. it's no difference between so-called God life. No, not God, I'm saying about heaven. Heaven's the life and yeah. this. So, but we, our idea is God lives in heaven. Who, who is this? Our? Uh, how about me? Okay. So the uh, idea is that God lives in heaven and we live in hell. So if uh, when a spiritual seeker like me wants to see that, then we don't see any difference. That its, it's level may be different. So how do I um, get to understand, like, if they, because we take, I take like small step at a time. So if, if this is hell and that is heaven, there's not much difference. So how do I go from there? Even but, Krishna but is the, giving... The thing is, it, it just depends on, the, because Vedanta doesn't say that God lives in heaven. But the study of Gita, like Krishna is saying, I am so and so, I'm so and so. I'm manifesting. I'm manifesting Manifest. through those things. So okay. these are manifestations. But he is not saying that, well, he's manifesting through everything. He's manifesting through deceit in gambling as well. So he's manifesting through everything. But um, a manifestation is not the same as, as the divine. The manifestation can help me, can take me, can guide me. So for instance now, this table that is lighted by the light. So th the table itself is not the light. But because of the illuminated table, my mind can go to the source of where the illumination came. So that's the idea. Um, if the universe is technically infinite, how does that help us understand our own problems? Are they supposed to seem minuscule in that sense? Or? Uh, say that again? Like, the idea of the universe is very infinite and it keeps going, so in that perspective, our lives don't, or the things that we do in our lives aren't that big of a deal, but they seem really big to us. How do you bridge that? No, those ideas? Okay. Uh, so, first of all, uh, to, to kind of put it in a little bit more accurate terms, the, the universe is not really infinite. Uh, it's huge. We could say it is, it's, it, it's mind-boggling. We could say it's beyond our mind to comprehend. But, but philosophically, uh, being a, if it's a material universe, it cannot be infinite. It will have some boundary somewhere. Um, that's first point. And secondly, yes, if we see ourselves as simply material beings, the vastness of this material universe and our own littleness, really, we really doesn't matter. Every minute people are being born and dying, just doesn't even cause a ripple. It just goes. So it really doesn't matter. Which can be pretty depressing. <laughs> the good news is that within us, within this material covering, is the spirit. That spirit, being non-material, is truly infinite. Now, if I can hold on to my identity as that spirit, 
then that is the only thing that matters. So what, whatever little significance, my, even my material being, whatever little, even if it is little significance it has, is because of the presence of the spirit. And so if we become aware of the deeper truth in our own heart, then it will not appear as if we are nobodies. But if we lose sight of that, then, yeah, it's, 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 it's not a very pretty picture otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So with this, we come to the end of chapter 10. Um, as you can see, it's a great idea. Uh, we, although we, we kind of went, we covered quite a number of verses. And I said, if you are interested in the, the details of who these different entities Krishna had mentioned are, uh, you can read it in the commentary in this book. There are other books also. If you can go to the Encyclopedia of Indian Mythology, Pura, there is on Pura, Encyclopedia of Puranas. Some of these names are mentioned, the, the, the Vasus, the Adityas, and if you want, if, you are, if that, those are the kind of information you are, uh, you are interested, you can find a lot of it. But the idea behind it, which is what uh, we, we focused on today, and we uh, will continue to focus it on in future as well, is that the divine is manifesting in and through all of those things. And it is through the visible, through the tangible, it becomes easier for us to go toward the source of all of this, and that is God. So that is the um, central message of this chapter 10. Om Jananim Saratam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Mohur Mohu. We bow down to Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother. So on Saturday, uh, we will celebrate uh, Guru Purnima. Uh, as we do every year. The Guru Purnima actually, according to the lunar calendar, falls on Friday. But for the convenience of everyone, so all can come, we'll celebrate it on Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. As usual, there'll be a short worship, prayer, meditation, music, um, a talk on the importance of Guru, and then we'll have potluck lunch. So all of you are welcome for the Guru Purnima celebration. And with that, uh, after that, our summer recess will begin. So we close after that. So we will not have the satsang on Sunday. So beginning with August 2nd to September 12th, about approximately a little more than five weeks, um, we'll have a recess. Our next program after Guru Purnima will be on September 13th, and that will be the Krishna festival. Um, that's Sunday it's, uh, at 11 on September 13th, our chief speaker, for the Krishna festival will be Prabhrajika Vrajaprana, who is from the Vedanta Society of Southern California, who you have had an opportunity to hear her. She, spoke, she was here at the Rama festival two years ago. And so that will be the function when we reopen uh, after the summer recess. So you're welcome for the Guru Purnima function. And so the Gita, Gita will resume. That is 13, 14, 15. September 15th, oh, 16th, 14, 15, 16, 16th. So September 16th, we'll begin with chapter 11 of the Gita. So that's the schedule ahead of us. Uh, let's now have the closing prayer on page three. May the divine being, who is the father in heaven of the Christians, holy one of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, 
Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the Great Spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace, and love. Om Shanti 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 He Peace, peace, peace be unto all.